welcome to the Sue Stevens Lighthouse Show. Today in the studio, we've got Joyce Daniels, and we'll be chatting to her about her various life experiences and playing some of her favourite music. She'll also be performing some songs live, so I'm really looking forward to that. When he's hungry and God charges no rent, he'll live as long as the old oak tree and laugh at fools like you and me. Oh, I often sigh and wish that I were the old man of the mountain. So, um, Joyce, it's your go now. What what did you find special about that song? Uh, Well, when I was a nipper, and I say about four to five, my father used to play the piano every night for for an hour uh, before he went to his club. So I used to stand by the side of him on his right-hand side and uh, listen and watch. And he started to sing some of the songs he didn't always play songs he played classical as well but this one particular song i loved it and i learned from him parrot fashion how to sing it so i always sang it with him and um sometimes he would say to me uh joyce if have a look in the piano stool which he was sitting on he made himself so the front came down he said and see if you can find a piece of music that you like because he'd got all his music on the stand Mm. so when I looked there was always this one on the top Cab Calloway and because he knew I loved it he always put it there and uh, it was um, an old man and there was a mountain behind him covered in snow and this man reminded me of Father Christmas because he got a big long beard and he got long white hair and he got a staff of some sort in his hand and he got like a I would call a satchel bag over his shoulder he was a big man and I was drawn to the picture and to Father Christmas. So that was it. So that's why I loved Cab Calloway. And uh, before I could understand music properly at four and five, I knew I loved the sound of it. And eventually, 
he started to ask me to turn the page over when he got to the end. Well, I didn't know how I knew, but I just knew. And if I forgot, if I wasn't there fast enough, he'd nudge me with his elbow. And that was my turn. So I gradually, without even knowing about it, was learning to look up and look down at the notes yeah. until I knew that was, a, that was an up note, that was a down note, so I've got to turn it over. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. So it was a fantastic way, really, to learn about tempo, about rhythm and about the notes. Black notes, he told me later on what a black note was worth, what a, a white note was worth, and then how they join up and what you have to do. diddly diddly diddly, diddly. That's what you have to do. So in a way, I was learning from four to five about music. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. That was my time with my dad. And did, did you ever, you never learned to play the piano? or? I did. did. Um, when I was about um, seven, six or seven, then he, he started teaching me what they call the five finger exercises on a piano. And you've got to do it with your left hand and your right hand. The left hand was more difficult, obviously, because it wasn't as strong. But I used to have to do that for, it felt like hours because your fingers hurt. Um, It was probably 10 minutes until, my, my dad by this time had cleared off to his club. So he didn't have to listen to this. Yeah. My mum did in the kitchen and she would say, so, that's enough now, Joyce, when she she yeah. really had had enough. Do you know, do you know it's strange because um, you're saying that you, your your piano in your house was in the kitchen. No. Oh, sorry. No, it was it was in the front parlour. Oh, it was in the front parlour. Oh, the best well, room. We had, a, we had a piano in our kitchen at our house. When we Good moved, We moved from uh, Smethwick up to, to uh, Quinton and there was no room to put... Dad's piano. So dad didn't need tuning well, all the I, I time. Know, but it was in the kitchen. But like like your dad, he'd come home every night and he'd play the piano there you are. while mum was cooking the dinner. See, you that's know, why we made so. Yeah. Amazing. Same amazing. upbringing, the same upbringing, yeah. No, it was in the front parlour, pride of place, because he'd come from a musical family anyway. Yeah. And he'd got uh, loads of sisters and they'd all got um, names of flowers, except Nellie. Auntie Nelly, why she? Well, that, that's, uh, I don't know. Somebody wants to take that up out there and make, yeah. name a flower after Nelly. Well, yeah, there you was Rosie, there, Daisy, yeah. Ivy, Iris. There was the, all all flowers except poor Nelly. Oh, <laughs> poor old Nelly. Yeah. Well, perhaps that was named after somebody else. I don't know. Else. Well, I don't know. He was in the <laughs> RAF abroad. I don't know. <laughs> Okay then. Um, right, we're gonna we're gonna have another song now. So um, this one's gonna be first real job. town called Obery. I'd wait for that 417 on those cold November mornings. A cheese sandwich and a flask of tea would give me sovereignty and shop for security. Deep down inside, I was really beside myself.
Pete Williams uh, with his first real job. Um, a song that uh, Joyce loves, it reminds her of her, her first real job, I believe. And um, <clears throat> to me, that, uh, listening to that track sounds very Dexy-ish, because I know he was a member of uh, Dexy's Midnight Runners. So come on then, Joyce, why is that so special to you? Well, because it was his first job, and while he was working, obviously he worked in a factory by the sound of that. And... Um, it's quite shocking for a young man or a young woman when they first go to a new job, to any job. Oh, but yeah, the first job is frightening. It's frightening because you're a child still That's right. in those days. And uh, his hopes and his dreams while he's working, because it, they're boring, mostly repetitive jobs. Um, the working class, the majority of working class kids in the Smethwick area and the, and the West Midland, the black country area, if you like, uh, went to. Um, so... It, his aspirations are all there, as were mine. Yeah. Um, but, and uh, uh, well, just interrupting there, I remember when I had my first real job, I'd be, like, just coming up to 15. Yeah. Because people don't believe me when I said I started at 14. Well, I did. Yeah. I was just a month away from being 15. And I sat at my desk after about a week or so, and I thought, oh, my God, is this it for the yeah. next 40 yeah. years? yeah. And I really did have those thoughts, and I thought, I've got to do something about this. Can't, yeah. can't well, it's your dream. My, my first job was at the Institute of Company Accountants in Portland Road, Edge Baston. Oh, yeah. And I was a council house kid, secondary modern educated. Yeah. But it was better than what they, the person who came to see us about our careers uh, suggested that I went to the Pitman's College and uh, learned shorthand. Oh, yeah. And I said, I- I'm not going to have to copy letters from from a bloke. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not. I'm, a, I'm in my own right. And the reason for my feeling like that is when I was 12, I had two books my father bought me. One was The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist by Robert Tressel. And he was, my father was a union man, shop steward in the Painter and Decorators Union. So that was the beginning of. And then the other one was the history of the suffragette movement, which really I was banging my head against the woodwork all my life from reading that book about the match girls and um, how it all began. Uh, So that's why I didn't want to be a secretary, just copying things that a bloke had told me to do. Yeah. And typing, I couldn't imagine it. But I was pretty good at maths at school. So um, I found this job at the then, um, the job, I don't know, they call them job centres now. Um, and I found this job. Now, I lived in Smethwick. And this um, Institute of Company Accountants was in uh, Portland Road. So I had to walk from our house. Yeah. Oh, um, that's quite a way. To catch the bus. No, to catch oh, I the bus. You were say you walked to I, I have Road. walked. Well, I walked back from Birmingham that way with a cello, Did actually. You? Yeah. yeah. Killing. Five foot nothing. In the winter. Was it was you. bigger than me in the winter. But nevertheless, that's another story. And uh, this number six Sand and Road bus, I thought I was really special. You know, I'd got my little bag with mothers put a, put me lunch in. Got my little bag and I was on, and people had got briefcases and things and they looked very important people on this number six Sandon Road. So I got off a Tagley Road, which is now the Strathallan. It's called the Strathallan now, isn't it? Yeah. And went round the corner well, to the know. Institute. I think it may have changed, changed yeah. name again now. I Big pillars at this house. And when you went in, it was really posh furniture and carpets. Instead of having lino around the edge and a carpet in the middle, this was carpet right to the wall. This was really, really <laughs> special. <laughs> and and we had a, lino do you know, I'd house. forgotten that. I'd forgotten that until I just mentioned it. Yeah. But I was a square peg in a round hole because yeah. I was all, they got, they hadn't got an accent, right? Well, they hadn't got a sort of black country accent like I had. <laughs> so I was a square peg in a round hole, and I, I was at the accounts office, and uh, it was upstairs in what in an attic, and there was um, this lady and me. This lady got permed hair. I'll never forget it, and it was breaking off. And I noticed when she was leaning in front of me to show me how to write numbers for the first week, nil to nine. I had to write numbers for a week. 
And what the, do you mean, right numbers? I had to practice writing nil to nine because there was no computers. And so, just writing it down, like? yeah, I had to practice writing like all this, you... and she had to check it every night when I went home. And then I did that for the, for the first week, honestly, apart from make the tea for her and the tea. And um, the reason I had to do that was because in those days, the ledgers that you had to write in were massive. They were massive. They were about six inches thick. They got at least half an inch to an inch of leather bound. Huge things. And they were about, I'd say, about um, two and a half feet in length. And and a very similar couple of feet in width. They were huge. It took me all my time to turn the pages over. So I couldn't write anything in these books until my letter, my numbers were right. And were readable, yeah. yeah. So that's what I did for the first week. I, needless to say, I stayed there, I think, about six or seven months, and then I left, and I got a job at um, George Mason's at the top of the bear. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. I, I, know, I remember the bear, I know it well. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's move on, and we'll um, we'll have another we'll have a, another tune. Um, this one's uh, going to be Cello Suite Number One in G Major. Um, the prelude Joyce you seem to we've we've got quite a few cl- uh, classical pieces on your agenda today um can you just talk about well this what, one why in... you love classical music right. so much because dad played it oh i see he yeah. played classics as well gotcha. as uh, as well as songs and that sort of 1930s for what he grew up with and he loved he'd heard his mother play him and his father play him yeah. and uh, so he played him as well yeah. and he was living it anyway it was his era yeah. so that's why i love the old the old songs because i grew up with them so th- this particular um one anyway is a, it's a cello Sweet. Okay. And I played the cello yeah. um, when yeah. I was 11. Yeah. I started playing the cello at school. I really went in to join the orchestra to play a violin. Yeah. And when I got there, I was a bit late. So all the violin parts had gone. And she said, here, have this. <laughs> so it, it, and it was already opened out of the box. And it was just a, a thing with a spike on the end. And, and I hadn't got a clue. And um, I said, I don't want to play this. I want to play a violin. And she said, no, this is what we've got left, Joyce. You'll play that. So I oh, did. And shame. I loved it. I loved oh, it. Oh, Absolutely took to it. Yeah, I loved it. But it was bigger than you, though. It was. <laughs> anyway, here we go with uh, Cello Suite number one. <laughs>
back to the uh, Sue Stevens Lighthouse Show. We've got Joyce Daniels here and she's going to do a, a lovely performance of a song called Tickle Me. Tickle me once, tickle me twice, tickle me naughty, tickle me nice, but tickle my heart. Come on and tickle my heart. Tickle my fancy, tickle my toes, tickle my tummy, right up to my nose, but tickle my heart. Just tickle my heart Tickle me in the morning Tickle me through the night Tickle me without warning That'll be alright Tickle me gently Tickle me rough I'll let you know when I've had enough But tickle my heart any time, tickle my heart. Ooh, 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 tickle my heart. Ooh, tickle my heart. Ooh, ooh, ooh tickle my heart. Come on and tickle my heart Tickle me in the morning Tickle me through the night Tickle me without warning You know that'll be alright Alright Tickle me gently Tickle me rough I'll let you know when I've had enough, just tickle my heart, oh, any time, tickle my heart, oh, come on and tickle my heart, oh, please tickle my heart. Yeah! More, 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 more. Okay, Joyce, um... That was written by Joe Brown, wasn't it? Joe Brown for his ukulele. Where did you find it? Um, it was... Uh, I went to um, a ukulele meeting at the Alzheimer's Athletic and Cycling Club after being invited by uh, someone, a couple that we already knew there. And this guy, um, Graham, was in the band. They also had a band. They ran a band as well as this ukulele group. And it was uh, Hugs, um, Hales in ukulele, group strummers and uh, it was one of their meetings and um, he came across with these little two white discs like like dices and he said have a listen to this Joyce and uh, I'd only been going a few a few weeks to this place and when I listened to it it was tickle me and I said that's absolutely fantastic I love it he said well I'll get you the music he said and, and, and you can play that well, eventually, the band took the took the song up. So Graham used to sing that. But I thought, I'm going to hang on to this. I'm going to keep it. And and if ever I do anything um, like a gig or anything, uh, I always start with this because it's an opener. It's uh, People love it. It's, uh, we all want our hearts tickled, don't we? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Oh, I have to be careful, though, because many, many times when I've played yeah. this, and we've been in a pub <laughs> or a club, and I have to say, it's called Tickle My Heart, H-E-A-R-T, because there's been various, what did she say? Did she say, da 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 Well, I didn't. It's Tickle My Heart. Yes. With all the blokes' uh, eyes oh, oh, glazing oh, over. All the blokes are glazing <laughs> over, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, we'll move on from there now, and uh, we'll, have, um, we'll have a little of The Entertainer by uh, Scott Joplin.
that was The Entertainer, written by uh, Scott Joplin, uh, played by uh, Joshua Rifkin, uh, which is actually a ragtime two-step. Joyce, um, I believe that reminds you of your Auntie Rose and Brother Reginald on Boxing Day. Uh, yes, well, it was Mum and Dad's wedding anniversary on Boxing Day. And um, so all his aunties, all his sisters, my aunties, and their husbands used to come up to our house in the afternoon and they'd bring a few bits and pieces and Mother would put some on as well. And because they were all musical as well, it, was, uh, it turned into, in the evening, a musical soiree, if you like. So while the, the, the wives, my aunties and my mum, was in the kitchen doing whatever, um, she, um, the men... In the afternoon, in the evening, six o'clock, I think the pubs would open. Down the thimble mill they went, and they had a few jars, and then when they came back, it all began properly. And uh, father would get on the piano, and they used to sing in harmony, and at barbershop. And he would get on the piano, and he'd go, on the piano, ding, 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 and he'd say, Rosie, that's your one. And she'd go, uh, and then he'd go, ding, ding, ding. Daisy, that's your one. Uh, and this went on with his sisters until they got it. And those single sounds slotted in together when they began. So so they wouldn't know I was there because my brother was 18 months younger than me. He used to have to go to bed first. So I used to slot myself in a stoop, if you like, with my knees under my chin, between the space in the piano and the wall to the opening of the stairs door. There was a little slot there. So I used to sit myself down there, stoop down, so they wouldn't notice I was there. I think father did, but he didn't say anything. And I used to listen to all this, and this harmony taught me also about harmonies, which I love. And I said to my dad once, because he saw me, he let me see that he was, he saw, he saw me. So he, the next thing was going to come out of his mouth was, it's about time you went to bed. So as soon as I saw that on his face, I said, Dad, Dad, what's my one? He says, your one, what? I said, what's my tune? And he said, listen for the sound. When you can hear nothing, that's your tune. And that's what I did. And I thought, oh, there's a space there. That's my tune. So I was listening, instead of to what was around me, I was listening to what they didn't sing. Mm. And that's harmony. It just all slots together. Mm. And that's why, that's why I loved it. So you were telling that, me... Oh, sorry. Um, I, I didn't answer your question. Um, Auntie Rosie always used to play ragtime. That oh, was her bit. Okay. They all did their bit. So Auntie Rosie used to play, apart from the dying swan, <laughs> and Uncle Ernie was the dying swan. And... Uh, she used to play ragtime, and my second eldest brother, Reginald, he was sort of 12 years older than I, um, he used to play ragtime as well on the piano when Dad went up the club. It, the, the piano was still open, so he'd play a bit of ragtime. And that's why I loved ragtime. But also, talking about singing there, did you used to sing with them as well? No, no. You I was, never ever sang with them? No, no. I was just happy. No, I was... How old was I? Five, six? Right, okay. You know, I used to... No, that, that was the last thing I did. You've told me that you loved to sing, though. And that oh, I loved to sing by my dad, yeah. When, when you were at school, you were told you couldn't sing? Yeah. The first day when I was 11 in the big school, yeah. and um, the headmistress who was taking assembly, I don't think they do that now, uh, taking assembly, she said, anyone that wants to be in the choir, stay behind, and Miss Mulholland, she was playing the piano for assembly, uh, Miss Mulholland will, um, is, is going to start the choir. You can be in the choir. So I stayed behind. There was sort of a dozen, probably, girls with me and because uh, it was an all-girls school. And um, so she went up to the piano and Miss Mulholland was... She got the longest fingers in Christendom. I've never seen fingers that long, ever. And that was coming off your piano like two foot at a time when she played. So she could put, she could put a finger in her ear and it yeah, come out the other side. It come out the other side, yeah. Oh, unbelievable long fingers. And um, I started to sing and she said, OK, Joyce, you can go. She sent another girl as well. She could go just before me. She said, OK, Joyce, you can go. And I thought, I can go. So I started to walk up this massive hall, new to me. And I thought, well, I want to be in the choir. So I turned round and went back. And I said, please, miss, I want to be in the choir. She said, no, you can go, Joyce. You can go. Uh -huh. 
So I started walking the back, and the doors were two two push up push open doors. They were huge doors with glass at top, you know, uh, but little panels, and they were really heavy doors. And it took me all my time to open these doors. So I got them slightly open, and I thought, no, I wouldn't be in the choir. So I went back, and um, I got halfway up this hall, and she saw me, and she said, "I've told you, what's your name?" I said, "Joyce Hilmes." She said. You can go. I've told you, you can go. I said, but please, miss, put me hands on me, on me waist. I said, please, miss, I want to be in the choir. She said, Joyce, you can't sing. Oh, I was absolutely dumbstruck, devastated, because I'd been singing by the side of me dad for, what, how many years? And he always used to nod and smile and, you know. And, and so I thought I was okay. And that absolutely, I was gutted, well, I can't sure, tell you. I, I'm absolutely sure that people that are listening to this show and heard you sing Tickle Me will uh, put a thumbs up to say that Joyce can actually sing. I'm, t- I'm chuffed now. Oh, yeah. yeah. What you've been... <laughs> I'm chuffed. <laughs> that you've been recognised. Yeah. <laughs> OK, what we're going to do now then is uh, we're going to have uh, another song um, tracked by uh, Pete Williams um, called Rough Necks and Roustabouts. Summers, my lips, your slender neck didn't meet. And when it's freezing, you remain crystal clear here. I'm wasting time, we make our own soul. Pass another helping, and I'll find room for more. I remember when times got bad. Friend I ever had How did we meet my sweet At a wedding reception I got platform shoes upon my feet You gave me love bites The kind of which never heal You made me an offer I'm still looking for A better deal mm. I recall all those times we had Days when I was just a man. Rough neck and roundabouts with bodies full of nerve. It seemed that there's a choice that turn the boys and girls get to me. Always seems to get to me. Williams. So, Joyce, why did you like this one? Um, again, um, it tells the story of his travelling days, I think, when he was with Texas. Yeah. And for the young man, I mean, the world was his lobster, really, wasn't it? <laughs> um, I won't correct you there, Joyce. No, well, um, no, don't. You've been saying that for donkey yes. years. Um, and um, he got everything for a young man. It was, oh, this is brilliant. And it's, um, again, the dreams he had in the factory, I think, 
when he's talking about my first job. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, this is happening to him. Yeah. And he's still only a young book, isn't he? He's only a yeah. young kid. And uh, I think this really tells the story of some of his experiences and adventures, yeah. you know. And yeah. he probably wasn't like he expected it to be in part, but he was enjoying the ride, if you if you like. We went to see him, didn't we? Uh, yeah. You introduced me to him at the, um, where was it, the Athletic? I was on Athletic. That's where I first saw him, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know who Pete Williams was, but I was invited to go to this um, Christmas party to do with this um, Hogs again, yeah. and the Black Country Ukulele Band, B-Cups, yeah. um, of which I later became a member of. And uh, he was there at this Christmas do, and um, my first introduction to a ukulele, actually. Mm. And uh, they were playing, they nearly all got ukuleles, and they was playing, and somebody was on the stage, and Pete Williams was there. And I said, it was Pete Williams, yeah. With Dexter's Midnight Runners, well, I don't know. I mean, I'd heard them, but I didn't know the, the individual ones. Mm. And uh, somebody passed me a ukulele and said, yeah, I said, I, don't, I can't play one. I've never played one. And they said, well, this is C, and it's just one finger on one string. Yeah. And when you pluck it, it's a chord. Yeah. This is C. So I'd got a, a bit of music. And when I saw the C, I just oh, played the C. And I had a ball. I thoroughly enjoyed it. All of a sudden, you know, I was a rock chick all of a sudden. <laughs> and it felt good. And the atmosphere in there was like, um, it was like being in a pub on a Friday and Saturday night when somebody's on the old Joanna. Yeah. And everybody's singing their heart out, you know. Yeah. And it, that's what it reminded me of. The atmosphere in there was... Um, Electric. A community. No, it was it was social. It was fun. It was fun part of music. It was the fun. So I was hooked from then on. And it was only, this was on just before Christmas. And then it was only on, as soon as the shop opened on the 2nd or 3rd of um, January in Blackheath, rock guitar, um, I went straight up and bought a ukulele. And that was it. And this was in uh, 2013, this was. In 2013. you know, and it's just just struck clubs and pubs. It now. struck a chord. Yeah, well yeah. said. Yeah, right. We're gonna have a, a live performance off you now. Then Joyce, oh, right. this is gonna be called "I've Never Been to Me." Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hey, lady, you lady, cursing at your life. You're a discontented mother And a regimented wife I've no doubt you dream about The things you'll never do But I wish someone had talked to me Like I want to talk to you Oh, I've been to Georgia and California And anywhere I could run I took the hand of a preacher man And we made love in the sun But I ran out of places and friendly faces Cause I had a need to be free I've been to paradise But never been to me Please lady, hey lady Don't just walk away Cause I have this need to tell you Why I'm all alone today I can see so much of me Still living in your eyes Won't you share a part of a weary heart That has lived a million lies Oh, I've been to Nice and the Isle of Greece While I've sipped champagne on a yacht I moved like Harlow in Monte Carlo And showed them what I got I've been undressed by kings And I've seen some things That a woman ain't supposed to see I've been to paradise But never been to me Sometimes I've been to crying For unborn children That might have made me complete But I took the sweet life I never knew I'd be bitter from the sweet 
I've spent my life exploring the subtle whoring that costs too much to be free. Hey lady, I've been to paradise, but never been to me. I've been to Georgia and California, but never been to me. I've been to Nice and the Isle of Greece, but never been to me. I've been to crying for unborn children that might have made me complete. I've been to paradise, but never been to me. I've been to paradise, but never, never, never been to me. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Joyce. Thank ah. you. Um, so why is that so special? Because it came out, She, a girl called Charlene, American girl called Charlene, and she um, she let it, uh, released it yeah. in 77, yeah. and then it didn't do any good. So in 82, she re-released it, yeah. and it went and it went that's the first time i heard it i've never really listened to those words it's fantastic it's fantastic well uh my daughter frankie she was 20 21 then yeah and um so i'd done the mum bit if you like and uh, i'd got done the wife the girlfriend and the wife and i was full-time job so Mm. i was i'd been running around like a whirling dervish for all of those years because you've got to have a sofa you've got to have a carpet you've got to go to work you've got to get this and um when I heard this, I thought, I've never been to me. No. I don't know who me I was. Of, I didn't know who me was. Happens, you know. So it hit, it hit yeah. with me. And, and it's still and you, you'd even now. Got, you'd only got one child. I think of the women yeah. who got oh, yes, four it's or still five, up, you know. So it's still it's happening. Difficult. It's so still difficult. happening. You've got, to, you've got to be a housewife. You've got to be a reasonable cook in those days. We hadn't got all this takeaway stuff. You've got to cook it. Fresh, yeah, haven't right. you? When you could afford it, of course. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you, Joyce. Uh, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to uh, move into a song called uh, "Short People," and we'll talk to Joyce about that one after. Yeah. 
we're gonna we're gonna expand on that when uh, uh, we come into the second half. But just briefly, Joyce, that that one used to play at bodybuilding competitions. Yeah, that you, you were judging. Yeah, and um, briefly, it was for a guy called Danny. Was it Danny Padilla? Padilla, who was quite short. He was five foot two. Danny five Padilla. Foot two. Yeah, eyes are blue. Yeah, <laughs> he got brown eyes. Yeah. Oh, he got brown eyes. The brown eyes. Yeah. Oh, I thought he um, was blue. Just no. Oh. No, Danny Pitt. He was five foot two. Oh, I right. said, "Yeah, um, Danny Pitt. That's he used to use that as his posing song. Short people, short yeah. people love, and and it went and he, his posing was perfect as well. So yeah, I saw Danny yeah. uh, in some of the international competitions, obviously because he was an in international. So, so how tall are you, Joyce? Five foot. That's why I like it. The people out there, this yeah. is no insult of salt to people yeah. who are short. It's just that uh, Joyce likes it. I'm five foot, five foot six in my stilettos when I was a teenager. And do you wear stilettos anymore? Oh, can't. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that was a killer dealer they were. I know. Especially if they got pointed toes as well. We used to, we used to push um, cotton wool or toilet tissue in the uh, front of our shoes in the toe to stop them turning up at the end. Uh, it worked. It worked. But yeah. my mother, you, I mean, I'd, I'd walk six inch stilettos with a pointed toe or a slashed toe with um, a real mink button on the top. That's how they sold it on Cape Hill Markets. I mean, it wasn't. <laughs> a mink it wasn't. Button. No, a mink. Um, a real mink that is love 19 and 11 pence thank you very much i'll have that and um i'd walk in the snow in my 16 stilettos and bop all night yeah. you know and but did you um, ever like me when you're walking in high heels or stilettos um have you ever walked like along the pavement and it's gone down the crack? yeah oh yeah pick many are drying then, up then, yes <laughs> yes and then you trip up <laughs> yeah it's, it's and trip trying up. to get off the bus and, and the shoes yeah. left behind yeah, I tried to get off the bus once. In well, um, We used to buy a straight skirt in, in the 50s. We'd buy a straight skirt, and they called them hobble skirts, cause, and we'd take them in. We'd taper them down to our knees. So we walked. We so learned you, to walk you from blokes, our... You blokes yeah. don't know anything about this. We learned year. to walk from our knees down. It was hysterical. Yeah. And getting off the bus, coming from work one night, I went to get off. My, my left foot went off, but my right foot... I stayed on the bus half on and half off because I was wedged in this. Flipping oh, Billy, really. And the man in front of me, I went, oh, oh, and he turned round and he he couldn't do it today, but he lifted, he got hold of my ankle and he lifted my ankle out of my shoe. And Can you imagine that happening today? I mean, yeah. it would be assault. Wouldn't it? It would. Yeah. It would be Any, assault. Anyway, we've got it. We've got to sort of uh, move on. So we'll uh, see you in the second half.
we finished the first half with uh, Crazy Dog and before that, uh, Short People. I just want to expand on that one, Short People, Joyce, um, because we, we were talking earlier about Danny Padilla, was it? Danny, Danny Padilla. Padilla, Padilla yeah. who was um, a fabulous bodybuilder. bodybuilder. And I believe, from what you've told me, well, I, I know it's true, actually, I don't believe, that you were an, an international bodybuilding judge. Yes. Um, yes. If you'd like to expand on that and tell us a little bit more about oh. what you did and how you got into it. Okay. Uh, well, I got into it by losing at a squash match. Oh, right. Um, I was uh, on the. I was fit, fit as a flea. Then um, I used to play um, table tennis in the Birmingham League, uh, badminton in the Dudley and Black Country League, I think that's the name, and um, I, I joined the squash ladder at Hales having baths. Yeah. So I was. Um, I saw the guy. Uh, two above me on the squash ladder, uh, it, uh, a guy, and you could challenge them to get their place if you like so I challenged him anyway you've got to book the court then I don't know whether they still do it so uh, I booked the court and Julie met this guy and I knocked seven bells out of this guy I couldn't believe it so I was two up you see which was great but he could challenge me back so he challenged me back he booked the court and I went I was absolutely marmalized I couldn't get anywhere near him I don't know what I, 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 I didn't know what was happening and I thought, I can't believe this, because I was full of confidence. You know, I was going to beat him, full of confidence. Anyway, coming out, I had my shower, I got changed. Coming out in the foyer, there was two guys drinking a coffee, and I recognised one of them, vaguely, as a friend of my brother. And his, his name was Terry. And uh, I said, blimey, Terry, I said, you've put some meat on your bones, you know, because he was like a lath when I saw him, and uh, with my brother Victor. And uh, he said, we've just been watching your match. I said, I've just been hammered. I can't believe it. And I told him the tale. And he said, shall I tell you how he beat you? I said, oh, do you play squash then? He said, no. He said, but he beat you on pure strength. He, he bashed it. You couldn't get it back. He sent you another one. He says, you did get some back, but you, you, your strength gave out. He said, Joyce, you should come down the gym at the athletic club, of which I was a member, um, at the Alzheimer's Athletic Club, and um, train your upper body, your shoulders and your, your arms. I said, Terry, I'm as fit as a flea. He said, yeah, you might be. But he'd beat you on strength alone, pure strength. So he said, look, I'm there on Tuesday. If you want to come down, I'll introduce you to Bob Fowkes, who runs the gym. And I, I said, I don't want muscles. He said, you won't get muscles. You've got just enough testosterone to throw a cup at Danny. That's my late husband. To throw a cup, and then it's gone. It's gone. You probably end up in tears. That was absolutely correct. That's what we do. So I thought there might be something in this. So I went on the Tuesday um, and he said, just wear loose clothes, any old scruffy stuff. He said, it ain't posh. So in I went. I'd never been in this gym. It was an old prefab that Bob Fowkes and his mates had put together a few years before. And I went in this gym and he said, uh, uh, Bob, and he introduced me to Bob Fowkes. And he says, all oh, right, he said, so uh, you want to get fit, T Terry tells me. I says, well, I'm already fit. He says, yeah, I know. <laughs> so he started me on Good Mornings. Good Mornings was a, a, like a pole at the back of my, I stood with my legs slightly apart, poised to, toes pointing forward, with this pole like a broomstick at the back of my shoulders. And I had to bend forward, keeping a straight back, bend forward and say, to myself, good morning, and then back up. He says, do three lots of ten of them. I thought, well, there was big weights all over the place and, and guys and, <coughs> and grunting. Again. And I'd got a, a broomstick on the back of me. And I thought, I can't believe it. Anyway, I did. I said this. He said, just do it. Just do it. He said, oh, there's the door. Just do it. And he, he didn't stand any mess in, did Bob Fags. God bless him. And uh, then he put me on. I said, I want to go on that. You know, the squat thing. I want to go on that. And he said, well, just do some of these first, warm yourself up some, do them. And then I, could, I still want to go on, yeah. So they put up with me. The lads, they was absolutely wonderful, didn't know any of them. They totally ignored me. It was as if I'd always been there. I did this squat with a bar. There was no weight either side. And I said, well, well where's my weight? He said, that bar weighs however many kilos. He said, I forget. He said, that'll be enough. He said, just do five squats. He said, don't go down as far as him over there because you don't want a big bottom, do you? And I said, no, thank you very much. So 
Anyway, I said, I'm going to fall forward. So he put, um, it's about an inch piece of wood, length of wood, the back of my heels. And he says, just go down. He said, normally, he said, I'd say, go down as far as me hand, but I hadn't better do that, had I? So he put the pole that I'd had round my shoulders underneath. He says, when you feel that touching, come back up. That's as far as you need to go. So I did all this, Julie. And uh, he said, after about 20 minutes, half an hour, he says, that's it then, Joyce, for tonight. He says, uh, come, not tomorrow. He said, leave, have a rest for tomorrow. He said, and come back the next day if you want to. And uh, I said, is that it then? And he said, well, yeah. And I thought, well, that was easy. Is this it? No weights at all. No weights. Just barbell. Just no no weights on it. How old were you then, Um, I was in my 30s. Oh, were you? So quite late to write weights. Oh, yeah, in my 30s. I started weight training when I was about 30. Yes. Well, I remember you saying this and and I thought, blimey. My muscles look like knots in cotton. Yeah. Uh, Well, (laughs) unbelievable. Anyway, that's how I got started. So... The next morning, he says, you might ache a bit tomorrow. He says, but you probably ache the day after. And I thought, ache me, fit as a flea. You're joking. Mm. The next morning, yes, I did. There was twinges. The next morning, I came down the stairs like the tin man from Yellow Brick Road. <laughs> I could not straighten my knees. I couldn't, I, I couldn't bend my knees, sorry. And I come down and said, dunk, 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 down the stairs. I still went to work. And I thought, there's something in this. So I was firmly convinced then. So when I got home that night, I thought, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this up. My badminton racket, my table tennis bat, my squash racket all went up in the loft. And I, I, I think I'm still there. Yeah. I never touched them after that. This was a competition because I love competition. And this was a competition not with anybody else. <clears throat> it was one with me. And it was brilliant, yeah. brilliant. So they took me to, um, the lads put up with me. There was no, never any swearing or any, there was some funny smells on a Sunday afternoon <laughs> after they'd ate the dinner. <laughs> but that was we won't it. won't go into that. <laughs> yeah, but, but that was it. That was it. That's as far as it went. There was no innuendos. There was nothing like that with these boys. Yeah. And they just accepted me as one of them, which I loved. They and just they, left and, me alone. And did they play music in the gym? No. Because they, in the gym I no. go to now, they've always got the music on. No, no. And sometimes I find it quite irritating. No, there was no music. I couldn't try into music. Because yeah. when you try in now, um, you have to, and a bodybuilder, a professional bodybuilder actually, told me a few years later, he says, when you're trying in, Get your mind in your muscle and you can feel the blood going in. You can feel what you're training. Concentrate, put your mind into your muscle and you'll get a better session. And it's true. Right. That's absolutely true. And you disappear. All your cares go away mm. because you're, you're totally involved. Yeah. And uh, that's what I loved about it, that and the sport. But they took me to um, a bodybuilding competition only because they'd got one spare seat and they'd got to pay for the, for the oil of this thing. And they said, do you, do you fancy coming to a bodybuilding competition? I said, I've never been. Well, do you fancy coming? There's a spare seat if you want, and it's going to cost whatever it was. Yep, it wasn't an overnight. He was up north. And and I went, and when I first took this up, I thought, like me, I'm going to go into this in detail. So I got books from the library, now Google or anything then. Um, I got books from the library on um, nutrition and, and muscle, the structure of the human body. And so you, it's like splitting the human body. Yeah. And I could, and then it made my training better because, oh, I'm training my biceps, I'm doing a bicep curly, and I'm doing a this and a that. Mm. So it made me enjoy it all the more. So when I went to this bodybuilding competition, I said, Terry, the guy, Terry Thackeray, who introduced me to bodybuilding, he said... Um, he says, what do you reckon then, Joyce? And I said, he's going to come in the first five. He and him, and him. First, second and third. Uh, so you'd already... Pure fluke. Oh, was it a fluke? Or well, I think it was fluke. Well, I think it was fluke. Well, I'd looked at him and I thought, oh, well, that's and this and that and this and that. And I said, he's going to come in the first five, and him, and him. Okay. First, he said, blimey. He says, how did you work that out then? I said, it's, it's muscle. I said, and it's about symmetry as well, Terry. I said, that's that's what it's all about, balance. You look in the mirror and you see, well, I could improve that. Or I could. And it's about balance. Now, what's happened to bodybuilding now is they've got to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until they'll explode. Mm. It isn't about bigger. It's about balance. It's about symmetry. Mm. Something 
beautiful to look at because the human body is beautiful, isn't yeah. it? It well, is. Mine used to be. No, it is. Regardless, <laughs> whether you're in fat, thin, tall or short. I've covered me then. Fat and short. <laughs> Um, it doesn't matter. It's still a beautiful thing from from when it began. That little seed from when it as is all life. Yeah. From where it begins, and you think all of that, which is all chemical, it's all chemical, yeah. which we don't understand. From that comes that little tiny baby toes that are more curly and pink, and you want to kiss them, yeah. don't you? It's a miracle, isn't it? It is. And um, I still think we forget. Too many people forget that the body is a beautiful thing, isn't it? It is. In, it is. Whether it's an animal or whatever, in it's a lovely thing. In some circumstances, anyway. Yeah. But how did so? How, moving on from that, then, how did you? How did you become? Uh, oh, an a international judge. Yeah. Uh, well, then they took. They told Bob, you know, uh, about it, and he says, uh, uh, "What did you do then?" I said, "Well, I'm reading all. I'm reading the books from the library, Bob, about nutrition and body." He said, oh, that's great. He said, well, there's a show one at the such and such. He said, um, if you want to go. So I went with the lads to this. He's going to come in the first first five. He's going to come and he's going to come. That was in the first three, first four again. And he says, uh, yeah, he says, you have done your homework, ain't you? So a few months later, he said, uh, Joyce, he stopped me uh, one night when I was training. He said, Joyce, he said, There's a, I'm going up to, um, to, to Bristol to uh, a gym up there, he said, where I'm doing um, like a, body, a, a, a judge's course. He said, you meet Mike Down, I think Mike Down's his name was, and, and it was in uh, some of Seven Sisters Road or something in the middle of Bristol. He said, if you want to come up, he said, it might be interesting because you're into this now. He said, you might find this interesting. When I got up there, it wasn't a course, it, it was an exam. Uh-huh. To become a national judge, bodybuilding judge. And uh, he says, go in for that. I said, I thought it was a course. He said, well, just go in for it. He said, it's a piece of cake, Joyce. Honestly, for you, for what, you know, what you've learned now, you'll find that a piece of cake. And I said, well, I don't know whether I want to be a judge. He says, just do it. In I went, no messing, Bob. In I went, fill these forms in. What's the deltoid? Where's the trapezius? Where's this and where's that? All that pictures that I'd seen of these muscles, they come in, boom, 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 boom. And um, I had a phone call to say, uh, Joyce, you'll be pleased to know that you are, you are qualified now to be a national judge. We've got a competition in, I think it was, Exeter. Is that on the east? Is Exeter is? In Exeter, in two weeks' time, that which we, we would like you to judge. Mm. So I went down. Obvi- it was all blokes then. Of course, there was women in America that was doing bodybuilding. I think they were doing competitions as well. Doris, Doris, somebody, Doris Barlow. She was older, but she was she was like the forefront of it over there. And so I think the reason that I was chosen was I was a female at the right time. Simple yeah. as that. Well, they hadn't got any female judges. Happen. A lot of things happen like that, don't they? Yeah. Right, right place, yeah. right time. Yeah, and that was it. Mm. And I'd bothered to learn. That's bothered to find out. Um, um, plus, women weren't competitions here then, but I think they were getting ready, if you like. Was it more, did you get more women in it in America than here? When I started we doing the international behind. ones, there was um, women competitors and some of the local ones, especially up north, it was big up north yeah. for, for males as well. But I cut my teeth on the men, really, on, on the male bodybuilders. Yeah. Um, but there was not much difference other than there was... Um, we then started, um, somebody said that they wanted, at the Ailes Having Athletic and Cycling Club, this is as well, that um, Joe Weeder, or ben, no, Ben Weeder of the Weeder Brothers in uh, America, was coming, was flying over to set up the English Federation of Bodybuilders. For, for, for those out there who don't know who um, the Weeder Brothers are, just explain to me, tell me about one of the most famous people that he trained. Well, Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger, but Schwarzenegger, yeah. them, you, them usually th- practically there before he gets them in. Yeah. You know, it's um, it's about to push push it further, and it's about money as well. I mean, muscle and fitness is money, isn't mm-hmm. it? So it's it takes that into consideration as well when they're looking. Did, he also did um, that guy who was in the Incredible Hulk. Hulk yeah, Lou Ferrigno. Lou Ferrigno. Well, 
actually, I met Lou Ferrigno and his wife and his child. He came to, I was judging one in Cairo, and he came as a, as a guest to give, to give prizes out. But um, he didn't stay. He didn't turn up. And no, then they told go, me he'd gone home. He'd, he'd gone home. He's got to go and put that little shirt on. And he'd gone home. Go, yes, you know, but he was deaf. That's all he could do. Green thing. Lou Ferrigno was deaf. Oh, was Stone it? deaf. Oh, yes. Oh, and that's so they gave him a part that suited. He couldn't speak very well. Ah. So they gave him a part. Yeah. Yes, he was stone deaf, Lou Ferrigno. Oh, well. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably time for um, perhaps another live performance. If we we'll just give uh, Joyce a second to uh, stand up and hold her ukulele. Get myself in together. I'm in. Yep. Strap I'm yourself in, in there. Yeah. So we're going to have we're going to have a little song called um, "Working Man." It's a working man I am And I've been down underground And I swear to God if I ever see the sun Or for any length of time I can hold it in my mind I never again will go down underground At the age of 16 years Oh, he quarrels with his peers Who vowed they'd never see another one In the dark recess of the mine Where you age before your time And the coal dust lies heavy on your lungs It's a working man I am And I've been down underground and I swear to God if I ever see the sun Or for any length of time I can hold it in my mind I never again will go down underground At the age of sixty-four Old will greet you at the door and he'll gently lead you by the arm Through the dark recess of the mine Old will take you back in time He'll tell you of the hardships that were had It's a working man I am And I've been down underground and I swear to God if I ever see the sun Or for any length of time I can hold it in my mind I never again will go down underground It's a working man I am And I've been down underground And I swear to God if I ever see the sun Or for any length of time I can hold it in my mind I never again will go down underground Thank you, Joyce. That was absolutely excellent. Applause Ta for Joyce. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, uh, we're going to move on to the next track now, which is going to be uh, Sunshine on Leith. My heart was broken My heart was broken Sorrow, 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 sorrow My heart was broken Beauty and kindness may 
tears clear my brain is while I'm worth my room on this earth I will be film of the same name. Joyce, I believe you were watching YouTube when you uh, came across that yeah. song. Yeah, I did. It came down the side of something I was watching and I thought clicked onto it because uh, I love the sound of um, chants and male voices and Russian uh, male voices and probably comes back from my childhood, Anything I suppose. Anything to do with male, if you ask me? Well, no, it, it, I just like that. I just like the that sound, the tree orky male voice choir, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. So, um, and they were singing this song. Yeah. And it was only a half pack stadium. And I, so it must have been at the beginning of lockdown, I would think. It was fairly new. And uh, they were singing it with such heart. Like, really, really. And the song is beautiful. Mm. And uh, it's telling the love of a town. You know, we love the black country, don't we? And in the black country, there's lots of towns. And we love the town that we was born in. We're part of the black country. I love Smithwick, but I love Hales Owen because I chose, I adopted Hales Owen over 40 years ago. So I could feel all of that coming home, if you like. 
And um, and I thought, do you know, this is the most fantastic sound. Mm. And then I got, I knew who the proclaimers were from I walk 500 miles up. Uh, but Pete Williams, getting back to Pete Williams again, Pete Williams did um, a tour, a supporting tour with the Proclaimers a couple of three years oh, ago. Right. Okay. And I think he was asked to do another one with them, mm. with them, you know. So they were they were new, fresh in my mind, the Proclaimers. And uh, this is one of theirs, and so that's why I chose it. All oh, right, OK. Well, um Let's just talk about your weight training days again, because there's something that um, that really comes out at me when you went to Las Vegas and you stayed yeah. in Caesar's Palace. Yeah, that was I just, posh. I'd just like you to um, tell me about that your escapade in Caesar's. Well, it well, probably wasn't an escapade. It was. But it, well, well, maybe it was an experience well, that you had there. Um, three weeks before that, I was judging one in Cairo. Yeah. That was a natural desert. Cairo, a desert. And it was a desert. Um, and I was staying at the Pyramid Hotel, all paid for, didn't cost me a penny. Uh, all I had to do was say East first, East second, and East third. That was that. And um, it was it's big stars there. Macaway was one. And um, three weeks later, about a week later when I got home, I was asked to do one in America, in Las Vegas, Caesar's Palace. So I was out of one man's. Uh, a, a, a natural desert and what had happened there which was nothing and I was living it, it was terrible yeah. Cairo was I couldn't wait to get out it was the only country I've ever wanted to get out the smell when I was coming off the plane was pure sewerage it was just mm. it was it was horrendous nevertheless well in the hotel where I stayed the pyramid hotel in Giza which is where the pyramids were they come out into the gardens and sprayed all these beautiful smelly Sprays because of the smell. Anyway, <laughs> so three weeks later, I'm in a man-made place yeah. in, in Caesar's Palace. And it was like landing. I landed at night. And it was like Blackpool, 10,000 times brighter, bigger and glaring. Yeah. And to tell you the honest truth, I thought it was gaudy. Mm -hmm. But the first night I stayed in um, Circus Circus because I wasn't booked till the next night for four nights. This circus circus, unbelievable. When I walked through the foyer, the, this is the truth, what I'm telling you. I believe the, you. There was a seal, <laughs> there was a real seal on a podium and he was balancing a ball on his head and nobody was taking any notice. Oh. And when I looked into this hall, it dropped down. It was just a sea of gambling stuff going on. And nobody was, this seal was, and there was a, he was throwing the ball up in there. Nobody know. He they just walked straight past him. And above me, there was a woman flying from one that trapeze man to another trapeze man in the ceiling. And nobody was looking. And I thought, I can't believe it. This is a madhouse. So I, I didn't sleep. I couldn't sleep that night anyway. So the next morning, this big limousine come. This, it, it was as big as a sharabang. And it took me to Caesar's Palace where I was shown a suite of rooms. Now, this suite of rooms, you have never seen anything like it. When I looked, there was a big round bed, and it was on a, a, a one-step plinth. There was a mirror above this bed. And then when I looked in the corner, there was the biggest bath sunken I've ever seen in my life. It was, round, it was oblong-shaped. And the tap... The ta I'm not kidding, I don't know what I'm measuring my arms here, which nobody can see anyway. It must have been over a foot or more wide. Really? And, yes, wide. And there was two taps, they call them four six over there. There was two taps either side, and it took all my strength to turn this tap on. And I turned the tap on, and it must have been running. I was just looking around, surrounded by all of this. Big vases and all stuff. Just stuff. And I went to get it. I thought, well, that's ready now because I've got to go downstairs to have this meeting with the judges. And when I stood in the back, it was only up to my ankles. <laughs> that's how big this bag. I couldn't believe it. More mosaic tiles and everything. I thought, I'm not going to have this. So I went and had a shower. I thought, I ain't, have, I ain't getting in. I ain't getting in. And but the back of the bed itself, there was all buttons in this, um, like, draylon or whatever it was, material. And there was... I was frightened to press a button because I didn't know what was going to happen to me. 
<laughs> and the, and the mirror, as soon as I saw the mirrors, I thought, oh, aye, aye. You know, <laughs> if anybody knocks that door. And um, it was gaudy, scary, frightening. Yeah. I'm a working class girl from the black country. Yeah. What's it all about? Yeah. And this was in, what, the late 70s, I think? Yeah. Mid seventies or something like that, so I was awed, overawed, but mm. frightened at the same time. I was out of my depth, in other words. Well, I was definitely out of my depth in these baths. It's I mean, up to my ankles. You didn't get in the bath here. Yeah, five foot two, up to my ankles. But the man who showed me to my room as well. Oh, as well, I forgot to say, you have a key to your room. Yeah. So the key was over a foot long. It was a Yale-shaped key. Bag, it was over the foot long. You couldn't put it in your handbag. Well, I didn't want to leave my room and leave my key behind there with what I'd just seen. Thank you very much. Yeah. But the man who showed me up, he said, um, this is this, that's that, that's your shower, that's this. And I said, thank you very much. And he stood by the door. He wouldn't go. <laughs> he stood by the door. And I said, yes, thank you. Thank you ever so much. I said, you've been a real he didn't. He wouldn't move. And I thought, oh, he wants a tip. So I got in my bag and I'd got some American coins because they gave me, they always used to give me an envelope with the country's uh, money in. Yeah. But I always made sure that I spent it in that country. I never brought any home with me at all. I always spent it there. And um, I just got it through some change. So I just give him this, this change. And he opened his hat and he looked at it. And I said, thank you, thank you very much. And he finally got the message then. I didn't know. I might have given him tops. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I finally got rid of him. Uh, <laughs> but it was fun. Fantastic it was fun. Story. It was a good competition as well, that was. Yeah. 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 Um, shall we have another live performance? Oh, would yeah. you like to do Blue Moon for I would. Us? I would. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. This is uh, one of my favourites that you do, it's, Joyce. Well, I love it. Um, 1935, this was, Rogers well, and Hearts. I remember it well. Me dad playing it, yeah. <laughs> right, and aunties, me flowery aunties. Blue moon, you saw me standing alone Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Blue moon You knew just what I was there for You heard me saying a prayer for Someone I really could care for Then the suddenly appeared before me The only one my arms will ever hold I heard somebody whisper, please adore me And when I looked, the moon had turned to gold Blue moon, now I'm no longer alone Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Blue moon of my own Blue moon You knew just what I was there for You heard me saying a prayer for Someone I really could care for Then the suddenly appeared before me The only one my arms will ever hold I heard somebody Whisper, please adore me. And when I look, the moon had turned to gold. Blue moon, now I'm no longer alone. Without a dream in my heart, without a love of my own. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It doesn't matter. She says she missed her. I did. I couldn't hear it. Could you? No way. Right, the next track we're going to play is going to be something by uh, Victoria Wood called uh, Let's Do It. I'm going to finish now with a romantic ballad. This is dedicated to my deep interest in the act of physical lovemaking. It's very short. <laughs> the ballad of Barry 
and freedom. Victoria Wood, what a woman. Um, 
She won a uh, new face, isn't she? In 19 something and something. Yeah, she was just brilliant. When I was just a, yeah. a baby brilliant. arms. Yeah. So, um, why did you choose that one? Um, because of the humour of it. It's, it's English humour, actually. Yeah. It's a sarcasm, which we're good at. Uh, but th- that stopped now with this politically correct people. We weren't supposed to do it. Plus, well, she and Julia Walters, because I know you like her as well. I'm a Smethic girl and Julia Walters lived in Smethic. And yeah, Bearwood. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah, her humour was just second to none. When Julia Walters does that soup one, soup, it, it <laughs> creases you. It just, it's classic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Dame, Dame Julie Walters, and we're supposed to be talking about Victoria Wood, but they were the best of friends. Yes, they? yeah, they were. Yeah, um, she was a clever girl, a good songwriter, Victoria, Victoria Wood. Oh, yes, yeah, definitely. and a scriptwriter as well. Yes, obviously she's got all those shows under her belt. Oh yeah. But, the, um, what was the one about the kitchens when they worked in the kitchen? Oh, dinner ladies. Dinner ladies. Yeah, that was funny. It was. Wasn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. English humour, that is. Yes, I know. Um, shall we? Um, shall we play another track? Let's um, let's play uh, "River Road" by um, our, our very own Ralph Moore, who comes to the Lighthouse Folk Club every yeah. week. Brilliant yeah. songwriter. Yeah. Wonderful um, wordsmith too. So let's go with uh, "River Road." I pass through Presidio and hit the river road. I've been gone for far too long, trying to pay some of these debts that I've owed. Life's thorny finger pointed the way, trying to tell me which way I've got to go. And I sound my own and punch the air and say River Road, take me home Well it winds and climbs and plunges And follows the Rio Grande Somewhere out in this wilderness Is a place I'm gonna make my final stand It's a refuge from the madness And the sanctuary of sand and stone And I lean my head out of the window And say, River Road Take me home And the mountains on the Mexican side They cast a spell over me As I sense that I'm getting nearer To the only place I really want to be I pass where the road once got washed away To flash flood damage, it's so prone And as the miles pass under these wheels I say River Road, take me home There's a straight stretch of road before me In the distance, and I watch it shimmer As the desert fall, it stands defiant as the sun's rays try to make it wither Tonight I'll hear the coyotes sing Their songs in such a beautiful tone And as the desert air cleanses my soul I say River Road, take me home One last dip, one last climb, one last bend to get around. There's a dirt road off of this highway, 
They'll take me to that old ghost town Now I know folks yearn for different things Why that should be will never be known But the one sure thing that I'm certain of Is River Road You brought me home Yeah, one sure thing that I'm certain of is River Road you brought me on So let's talk about uh, River Road then Joyce um, I know that you met Ralph at the Lighthouse Folk Club and I, I've known him for for some years and I, I reckon you've only known him for about maybe three, four yeah. maximum I first saw him at the Crystal Oh, did you? Yeah, so oh, that's the okay. first time I saw him. Yeah. And um, it, I don't know what he was playing, but I thought, blimey, that's cr- he's great, he is. Yeah. And then um, I told him, because it was a very small room, so he got to walk past me to get a pint. And I said, excuse me, I said, I really enjoyed what you've just done. Mm-hmm. And he said, all oh, right. I said, are you coming next week? And he said, and now he said, I'm going to America. He said, I go to the States for six months yeah. every year. And I thought, blimey, he must travel, you know, he must be like really up there yeah. in the music world. Yeah. And uh, that was it. I left it. And then, of course, he disappeared. And then um, he came back and I remembered him and um, he sang this, this River Tillingwa Road. one. Yeah. And I thought, that's crazy. Yeah. This um, River Road. And it was like somebody's going home. And I thought, well, it's six I months, think, he think, must have a home yeah. there. I think you know. that was his spiritual place to yes, be, you know. Yes, he told me later it was, yeah. 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 Uh, but I didn't know that. But why imagined, because when you listen to a song, you, your imagination runs right at mind does. Mm. And uh, it told me, it spoke to me of what he must have been feeling, because that's what music does, isn't it? It's a yeah. connection. Yeah. 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 Okay, then shall we have a little bit of Brown Eyes Blue? Oh, go on then. Another live performance off yourself. Go on then. Off you go. Why not? been so blue don't know what's come over you you found someone new and don't it make my brown eyes blue I'll be fine when you're gone I'll just cry all night long say it isn't And don't it make my brown eyes blue Tell me no secrets Tell me some lies Give me no reasons Give me alibis Tell me you love me And don't let me cry Say anything Just don't say goodbye I didn't mean to treat you bad I didn't know just what I had But honey, now I do And don't it make my brown eyes Don't it make my brown eyes Don't it make my brown eyes Secrets tell me some lies. Give me no reasons, give me alibis. Tell me you love me and don't let me cry. Say anything, just don't say goodbye. I didn't mean to treat you bad. I didn't know just what I had. But honey, now I do And don't it make my brown eyes Don't it make my brown eyes Don't it make my brown eyes blue Don't it make my brown eyes Don't it make my brown eyes Don't it make my brown eyes blue My brown eyes don't it- 
it make my brown eyes? Don't it make my brown eyes blue? Lovely, Joyce. Equally as good, if not better, than the Crystal Gale version. Oh, how lovely! Oh, that's great. <laughs> I've got to butter you up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right, we're gonna we're gonna move on now, and we're gonna play um, something by um, Chuck Berry called uh, "Johnny Be Good." performance from Joyce and this will be the last one from her. Off you go, Joyce. Don't come the cowboy with me. Some boys with warm beds and cold, cold hearts can make you feel nothing at all. They'll never remember and they'll never mind if you're counting the cracks in the wall. They're quick and they're greedy, they never feel guilty, they don't know the meaning of hurt. The boots just go back on, the socks that had stayed on. The next time they see you, they treat you like dirt. The next time they treat you like dirt. Now don't come the cowboy with me, Sonny Jim. I know lots of those and you're not one of them. There's a light in your eye tells me somebody's in And you won't come the cowboy with me Don't be too rough on my cold, cold heart It's all I've got left to me now I fell out of favour with heaven somewhere And I'm here for the hell of it now Some girls play cowboys and some boys play harder to get But they've got just the same They smile and say cheese, they're so eager to please But they'll never remember your name The names and the places all change But don't come the cowboy with me, Sonny Jim I know lots of those and you're not one of them There's a light in your eyes, tells me somebody's in And you won't come the cowboy with me 
Did somebody tell you I'm lonely as hell? I didn't expect you to know me so well. If I learned a lesson, it's how to bounce back again. Sometimes I bounce off the wall. And sometimes my head hits the floor. So don't come the cowboy with me, Sonny Jim. I know lots of those and you're not one of them. There's a light in your eyes, tells me somebody's in. And you won't come the cowboy with, don't come the cowboy with me, Sonny Jim. I know lots of those and you're not one of them. There's a light in your eye, tells me somebody's in. And you won't come the cowboy with me. Oh, very good. Very Did you get it in? Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> yes, we got it in. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. That song, why? Very quickly. Um, yes, um, Kirsty McCall again. I was looking through oh. YouTube and um, I saw it, heard it, and then forgot about it. And then Alan, the, my duo partner, bought it as a, a group of songs for us to have a look at. Okay. And uh, I said, This ain't really. I th- and I thought, I'm sure I know this. I've heard this. Mm. And so he said, Have you used it? So that's what I did. Oh, excellent. That's excellent, how I got it. Excellent. Um, Another gift. Another gift, yeah, and you keep saving these gifts up, don't you? Yeah. I know that you're very possessive about your songs, aren't you, once you've got one that you really, really like? Uh, yes, yes, I am. Are. I showed someone um, a song uh, that was given to me, mm. and um, they d- I don't mind if they copy it as it is, yeah. but they changed it and... Yeah. Um, Professed it to be theirs. Oh dear! Yeah. Oh, flipping it. That's not very good, is and, it? Uh, and I thought, oh no, that's not right, is it? Yeah. Well, I mean, they're not really your songs, but I suppose no, if, no. If you come to that, it's it's not a very good. thing. Well, it's called they? plagiarism, isn't it? It is called plagiarism. Yeah, that's a big word, isn't it? For black well, if I can spell that as well with our education. Secondary anyway, modern. anyway, we must wind up now. Um, just to say, you've been listening to the Sue Stevens Lighthouse Show. Um, we'll be here again. Uh, in a month's time i believe um thank you all for listening stay safe stay well and look after yourselves bye for now